Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. Leonardo da Vinci said, Once you have tasted flight, you will forever walk the earth with your eyes turned skyward. For there you have been. And there you will always long to return. Hello and welcome to another episode of the No Limitations podcast, where we meet the elite, world-class performing men and women, and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies, and that you could apply to your own life. I'm your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, Executive Search and Board Advisory Firm. This episode, with Graham Millett, Chief Executive of Western Sydney Airport, is some 600 years later than Da Vinci's thoughts, but it's more or less on the same theme. As the wealth of the world grows, the appetite to travel grows. And with that comes exciting opportunities for Australia to welcome the global traveller and, quite frankly, reap the rewards. A big part of our success will be the construction of the new airport and the Aerotropolis. In this captivating discussion, Graham shares his passion and fears in being tasked as the leader for one of Australia's landmark infrastructure projects. Graham has over 20 years' experience in senior executive roles across the aviation and telecommunications sectors. Prior to joining Western Sydney Airport, Graham was Head of Facilities and Fleet at NBN and previously Group General Manager of Qantas's Property and Procurement Divisions. Graham is also a trained pilot by background. Today we cover the facts, the costs, the hurdles, the timelines, choosing a team and what we as a nation should expect for our money. We learn about the future of airports, the impact of technology and what is keeping Graham awake at night and what success will look like. So join me in this stimulating conversation Aerotropolis, the future of international airports with Graham Millen. Graham, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Greg. Good to be here. Graham, it's a very, very big job. And all of us in Australia are interested to see where you take this Western Sydney airport. Why did you take the job? Some jobs come along, I think, um, once every now and then. Um, some jobs come along once in a decade. Uh, this job was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, the, the opportunity to build something that will last for at least 100 years and uh, and probably longer if aviation doesn't change very substantially. But it was also the opportunity to start something from scratch, yeah. to um, develop a team that could um, deliver an airport for the 21st century for uh, a part of the world that uh, has, I think, lacked in uh, the facilities that the 21st century can offer. So this was an opportunity that was frankly just too good to say no to. Greenfield site. Absolutely, Greenfields. I was on site yesterday, actually, um, showing some people around. And first of all, they uh, they were astounded at the scale of the of the project. So we, we drove around the site. That took forty minutes at sixty kilometres an hour. Uh, it's it's nothing but rolling hills, grassland. Uh, the distance between the highest point on the site and the lowest point on the site is the equivalent of a twelve story building. So forty one metres. Is that right? That's that's correct. And we have to level that. So we have to take it to within a 0.1% gradient. So we, we have to reduce it down from all of that undulation that we currently see at the moment on the site to um, basically a flat earth, uh, and that will be the platform upon which we, uh, we build the airport. If we take you back a little bit, Graham, what do you feel are the attributes for you taking on this role? So in order to fulfill this role successfully, I, I, I think that there are some uh, essential factors. I think the first one is um, a love of aviation, to be honest with you. I think you've got to, to love, love what you do. If you love what you do, then it's not work. Uh, the bonus is you get paid for it, and, and I love aviation. Um, I think that's, that that's really is a prerequisite for this, for this project. I, I think 
also um, having the right skill set, the right experience. So I, I worked at Qantas for a, for a 20-year period, um, loved pretty much every moment of it. Uh, that was important. Understanding how infrastructure works, how airports work is is really important. And that's from the cockpit, cockpit downwards? That's from the cockpit downwards, yeah. Um, that's, that, that, that's another critical component. I think the, the, the desire to want to establish something that is going to stand uh, the test of time, something that is in fact timeless, was was also uh, a key criterion for um, for being successful in, in this project. So it's a mixture of skills, it's a mixture of experience, it's a mixture of, of attitude. It's it's all of those things that I think combine to produce uh, what hopefully will be a winning formula. So what are the components of the first digital airport, Graham? What are, what are we going to be anticipating and looking forward to? I think that people who use the airport, whether that's airlines or whether it's passengers, whether it's freight operators or, or visitors to the airport, members of the local community, I think they can expect a very different experience to that which uh, has prevailed in, in, in the past and, in fact, in, in the present in, in Australian airports and also most airports around the world. So I think initially you'll find that there's an airport there which is has been incredibly well planned with 21st century uh, capability. Uh, by that I mean it's being designed for 5G and with immediate upgradability to 6G. So al- already overseas uh, there's uh, work going on looking at 6G and uh, and yet here in Australia 5G technology doesn't get introduced for roughly another 12 months or so. Yeah, right. So this airport will have 5G capability from day one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will have exceptional uh, transport links for access and egress. So we're working very closely with uh, roads and maritime services. We're working very closely with Sydney Metro Transport for New South Wales to make sure that we have the right road and the right rail connections. Uh, that will be important. You'll find that There'll be an aerotropolis nearby. Um, we'll talk perhaps a little bit about aerotropolis mm. later, but there'll be uh, a, a commercial hub uh, nearby uh, with businesses and with with residents, uh, with easy access to to, to the airport. Yeah, from a technology perspective, uh, you're going to find what we call a low friction airport, and uh, a number of airports around the world are, are trying to achieve uh, very very low friction at the moment. What that essentially means is that it's uh, a very speedy throughput of passengers and freight for that matter uh, into and then out of the airport whether you're arriving from uh, a flight or whether you're departing on a flight uh, speed is 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 very important so at the moment uh, if you if you depart internationally generally you have to get to an airport about three hours in advance yes uh, you go through the process of immigration and customs and you typically stand in a machine where it spins around and checks you out for undesirable uh, items uh, you then go through and the chances are that somebody will ask you to open your bags and you'll have to spill out what's what's in in your hand luggage they'll have a look at it they'll take out any items that shouldn't be in there and then uh, you have the ignominy of having to uh, stand aside and then repack your bag in, in front of lots of other people. Uh, what we intend to do is we intend to use technology that currently is being trialled uh, and that will enable you essentially to be able to walk through a, a corridor and uh, you'll be uh, checked for security reasons, for border control reasons, uh, for all the reasons that you currently checked. That will be done um, with no touch. Uh, so this is a very desirable situation to be in. You'll find that there'll be retail, which is 21st century retail, and what that means is that uh, it will mesh with e-commerce. Um, so you might necessarily not want to buy while you're in the terminal. You might buy it at home but pick it up in the terminal. So there's a range of uh, options here that uh, aren't available at the, at the moment pretty much by any, certainly anywhere in Australia and pretty much anywhere in the world um, that we intend to have in, in place. Is there any particular models from out, outside of Australia that you're, you're closely identifying or following? Yeah, so people often ask me, which airport in the world are you modelling Western Sydney Airport on? And the answer is there are many. Mm. And the reason for that is because there is no single airport that excels in all of the areas that we're interested in. So there's no airport that excels at freight but also excels in the passenger experience and also excels in the airline experience and and also excels in terms of access and egress etc etc et so as as an example uh, we're looking at uh, Changi airport mm-hmm. in Singapore uh, it is uh, been named several times now as uh, best airport in the world by passengers for the passenger experience yep. so we're looking at, the, at how they're doing things 
Uh, if you look at the way the airport integrates with the local community, uh, there is much to learn from Incheon in South Korea, Dallas-Fort Worth in the United States, Atlanta. These sorts of, sorts of airports integrate exceptionally well with their local local communities. Uh, with with freight airports, we're looking at uh, airports such as Gatwick, which which seem to do a pretty good job at startup. With, with freight. Sustainability uh, is very important to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're looking at airports which uh, have come on stream and are either carbon neutral or ne- near carbon neutral. That's our objective. Wow. Aspirational at this stage to open as a carbon neutral airport, lots of renewable energy uh, and with low wastage levels, lots of recycling, etc., etc. So there is, I'd have to say there's no single airport. In, in some respects, I wish there was. But there's no single airport that fits the bill for us, um, but we're taking the best of the best and incorporating it into the Western Sydney Airport. So can you give us a couple of facts, Graham, in the sense of um, timelines, capacity, Sure. Uh, maybe a broader view of what do you think would be the economic impacts? Happy to, all? happy to, yes. So the, the airport itself has been located in Western Sydney for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, Sydney is running out of uh, aviation capacity uh, and it's doing so at a very rapid rate. Sydney Airport is nearing uh, the peak capacity. Uh, in fact, studies show that probably around about the mid-2030s, uh, you won't be able to uh, commence a new service into or out of Sydney um, because it, it will be maxed out. Mm-hmm. Now, that that is probably true. Uh, timeline is roughly, roughly right. Sydney's got a little bit more capacity to add with some work that it has to do, but that doesn't change the fact that it, it, it will uh, reach its maximum capacity. Um, this uh, airport that, that we're building uh, substantially changes that. Uh, Sydney Airport at the moment is processing about 43 million passengers per year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will grow uh, and probably grow to around about 60 million passengers per year, maybe maybe 65 million passengers per year. Much beyond that, it's doubtful, is frankly. That, and is that still with curfew? That's still with curfew. It's, okay. it's, ext- it's extremely unlikely the curfew will ever be lifted because of the noise issues. Yeah. And, of course, the movement cap uh, is, accompanies the the curfew. The airport that we're building is being built in four stages and we're building stage one. Mm -hmm. Stage one will be what's called a 10 map or 10 million annual passenger um, terminal. It will have a single runway. The runway will be 3,700 metres in length uh, and that's a length that will accommodate the largest aircraft that currently fly and the largest aircraft that either Boeing or Airbus proposed to build for construction over the next 22 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. And when I say the largest aircraft, people people often think that the A330 as the largest aircraft requires the, the longest uh, takeoff uh, run. And that's uh, that's not true, in fact. You know, the 777X uh, is an aircraft that requires probably an extra 200 to 250 metres on top of the A380, but it will accommodate that aircraft. So we start off with that with the single runway and we start off with a 10 million annual passenger terminal. Now that grows uh, after about 10 years, so from late 2030s or so, uh, what happens is we add on to the first stage of the terminal building a second stage to accommodate a further 5 million annual passengers. So we're now at 15 million annual passengers mm-hmm. uh, on a single runway. Flip forward another 15 years or so, and the size of the airport more than doubles then. So we add on another module, which takes the total capacity of the terminal building to 37 million annual passengers. But we also add a second runway, a second parallel runway, again, of 3,700 metres. About 12, 15 years after that, the fourth and final stage of the terminal building get con- gets constructed. And this takes the uh, the overall airport to a capacity somewhere around the 82 million mark that's okay. an, annual annual passengers but the reality is that with technologies evolving the way they are the efficiencies etc um, changes in processes it's likely that although designed for 82 million annual passengers it will probably accommodate closer to 100 million annual passengers now that makes it one of the largest airports of its type anywhere by comparison, um, JFK last year did about 80 million passengers. Is that right? JFK, about 80 million passengers. So you're looking at a very, very substantial airport. You're looking at an airport that not only maintains Sydney as the aviation hub of Australia, but in fact maintains Australia as a key aviation hub in its, in its own right, which is extremely important. And the reason it's important is because Last year, worldwide, mm. about 4 billion people travelled by air, about 4 billion. 
Flip forward 20 years and all of the estimates show that that number doubles. So it goes from 4 billion to 8 billion. But the key to all of that is that most of the growth is in the Asia Pacific region. Yeah. And not only that, but what you're also going to witness in the Asia Pacific region is an incredible uplift in terms of the number of people in the middle class. So in India, in China, in many of these Asia, Asian countries, subcontinent countries, um, you're going to find that uh, the number of middle class people uh, increases and what the middle class people like to do, they like to travel. Mm. Where would they like to travel? Well, many of them we know would like to travel to Australia. Yep. And so ensuring that we have the right sort of capacity here to handle the influx of, of tourists, but also to handle what I think will be uh, an increasing amount of air cargo is, is exceptionally important for the economic future of this country. Have you got any clients signed up and prepared to land their first planes? Well, it's interesting. We've, um, we've had public statements by both Qantas and by Virgin Australia that they will be flying into the airport on, on day one and, and not just their, their low-cost arms. So, so people often say to me, oh, well, you'll have Tiger and you'll have Jetstar there. And that's true, we will have, but we'll also have Qantas and we'll have Virgin and we'll probably have Singapore Airlines and Cathay Pacific and British Airways and um, in New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, D DHL, I, I think, um, probably Amazon, um, I'm speculating now, uh, yeah. with a hopeful tone to my voice. <laughs> um, you'll see the likes of FedEx and the likes, the likes of UPS. So all of, all of those sorts of. Some of the largest airlines in the world. It, all, it, it, exactly. I mean, most people don't know that Amazon is one of the largest yeah. freight carriers in the world. It's got a, pretty much its own fleet, least fleet of aircraft. Um, so the, the infrastructure that the airport establishes is vital, absolutely vital to the economic development of, of this country. And it's vital to the social development of, of the region. I, I grew up in Western Sydney. Yep. And Western Sydney has always been considered the, the sort of the fourth region after the eastern suburbs, the northern suburbs and the southern suburbs. And uh, we have an opportunity to very much change that. And uh, that's what we intend to do as a, as a team building the airport. That's what we intend to do. What about the uh, the question, I arrive at this new airport, mm. I've got to get to a business meeting or I've got mm. to get into the other side of town. Yeah. Um, how do I get there? Well, I think you're probably going to be looking at a very different sort of travel to that which you, you're used to today. Um, so we've been having some conversations with uh, a company called Uber Elevate. Uh, Uber Elevate uh, is the, the drone version of, of Uber that uh, most people know and love. Um, Uber Elevate have, in fact, signed a memoranda of agreements with um, DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth, and mm -hmm. with LAX, Los Angeles, to commence commercial drone services in 2023 which, of course, is ahead of our opening in 2026. Right. And what they're proposing to do is to offer uh, essentially flying cars, if, to put, put it simplistically, flying cars that pick you up at the airport and then take you to your destination. That can either be with a, with a pilot, in inverted commas, or, or it, it can be autonomous, depending upon lots of different issues that have yet to resolve themselves over the next few years, airspace design, for example, safety issues and what have you. But trials are going on at the moment in Canberra uh, involving the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, uh, to see what can be done in this regard. So for, for those lucky enough to have flown into Hong Kong Airport recently and to, to, to stay in, in the city, uh, they'll know that you can catch a helicopter to in the their town. To the likes of the peninsula, to the, to the likes yep. of, the, of the peninsula. Now, rather expensive, I have to say, rather expensive, not having been uh, in a position to take advantage of that mode of transport myself. Um, but uh, certainly ideal because the, the time between checked up cock in Hong Kong and then into uh, into the peninsula is is something like twelve minutes. So if you can if you can um, democratise um, domestic air travel by by the use of drones over short distances. Uh, then uh, and and price wise um, democratise it. Then you're looking at a, a, a time lag between Western Sydney Airport and Sydney CBD of about 13 minutes, according to Uber. It's not fantasy. Like so you don't minutes. think it's, so it's not fantasy? It's actually going to. Oh, happen. I don't think it's fantasy at all. I I don't think it's fantasy at all. I think this is just another example of the disruption that's occurring in in society, um, and and it will be real. Will it be real in 2026? Well, I simply point you to the fact that. Uber are proposing commercial services uh, in 2023 in the US. Uber are now looking at Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne as, uh, f for them, overseas uh, locations to, to commence operations in. And I think you'll certainly see it. I think the real challenge here is not the technology so much around the aircraft themselves. 
uh, I think the technology is around the airspace design yeah, and, right. and making yeah. making sure that these things don't bump into each other or bump yeah. into bump into other things. Uh, and and certainly CASA and Air Services Australia are, are very much aware of this technology. The fact it's coming. Uh, and uh, it's it's largely unstoppable. So the question is, how do you then make sure that it operates efficiently, that it operates safely, mm. that it operates effectively, and that it's available to as many people as possible? Graham, what is an aerotropolis? Uh, an aerotropolis, the, the definition of an aerotropolis depends a little bit on who you ask, to be honest. But uh, I like to sit of it, I like to think of it rather as uh, an aviation city. So it's a combination of residential and commercial and perhaps some light industrial types of facilities uh, that have been well planned, uh, that uh, are appropriately close to an airport because there is an advantage in, in the residents and, and the commercial businesses, the light industrial businesses, being close to an airport. So an aerotropolis is essentially that. And prime examples of, uh, of, of really good um, aerotropoli is the, is the uh, plural. Uh, Incheon, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Schiphol. Uh, and uh, Dallas Fort Worth. Now, and Kingsford Smith is not one, is it? And no, certainly not. No, it was never designed as such. It was mm-hmm. never designed as such. Um, but with r- really good planning, these uh, these these sorts of uh, facilities can be can be quite amazing in the effect they have. If you take Skipole, for example, Skipole have an aerotropolis uh, that has been operating for many, many, many years now. Probably the first of its kind, I'm guessing, but 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 certainly one of the first of its kind. Um, when it opened, and this is a story that was relayed to me by somebody who worked at Skipol, um, so I haven't validated the facts, but I have no reason to doubt them either. Um, this this chap said to me that uh, when Skipol opened, there was virtually no flower business. There was out of out of Amsterdam, virtually no flower business. And uh, today, um, and I find this number absolutely breathtaking, if it's correct. So I. I I'd like somebody to check it and tell me, but uh, I heard from this chap that today and every day out of Schiphol, they ship 80 million blooms, eight zero million blooms. Every day? Every day. It's not every week, it's every day. Now, if that's true, just think of the economics of that and what yeah. it's doing for that, for that city and for that, for that country. So um, an airport and the aerotropolis around it, the, the businesses around it, have an, an, an enormous uh, multiplier effect mm. uh, on uh, both the social and the economic standing of the region, the state, the, and, and the country. So who, who puts the aerotropolis together? How does this all yeah, so, which, which planning party are you going to be after working with? Ah, so the Aerotropolis uh, is a, uh, a work that's being conducted at three levels of government. And I have to say uh, that originally I was sceptical about the three levels of government to work together, yep. and uh, I've been disabused of that. I've, uh, I've been delighted to see how well they are operating. I'm surprised and delighted. We're keeping but, a straight face too. Well, yes, uh, and I am. And the, 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 state, the state government, the federal government and the local councils have all got together, uh, regardless of their politics, yep. and they've decided that they have to make this successful. And so the state government is leading the charge. Mm-hmm. on the aerotropolis. Um, there's a lot to be done uh, because the whole region really is, to a large extent, a greenfields region. It's rural and semi-rural. Um, there's very little um, water articulation infrastructure. There's very little sewage, which yeah. for a 21st century city is crazy. Yeah. Um, the electrical reticulation um, services those people who are there at the moment um, and now the population is going to boom in, yep. the, in that part of the world. We can talk about the population numbers in just a moment. Okay. Um, that's, that's going to change quite radically. Um, we're talking about 5G inside the airport but we're also talking about 5G outside the airport. So there's massive telecommunications infrastructure that has to be constructed. Roads have to be constructed. There's a new rail line which the, the federal government the state government have, have agreed on. Um, all of these things have to be put in place uh, and they're not there now. Uh, so the three levels of government are working really closely, and I, I attend regularly um, various meetings to ensure that the Department of Planning is working well with the um, Sydney Water and, and uh, pri- the private sector, that uh, the councils are working co- closely, not, not just with the other levels of government, but with each other as well. And uh, I'm uh, optimistic about what we can achieve uh, in that part of the world in what is a relatively short period of time. We're, we're, we're talking less than a decade, uh, not not long at all, certainly not in infrastructure terms anyway. What do you see as the, uh, the greatest obstacles for success? Um, 
I think the ability, uh, I think first of all, everybody has good intentions when it comes to uh, that, that, uh, that regional development. That's, uh, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, I think the obstacles are going to be the nation's ability to build, to be frank. I think mm-hmm. the construction industry is under enormous pressure in this country. Uh, the amount of infrastructure that's going on is ext- is extraordinary. It's at all-time highs. The figure that I saw recently was that in New South Wales, there's something like $87 billion worth of infrastructure uh, being constructed, and there, there will be for at least the next five years and probably the next 10 years. And to put that in perspective, the previous peak was about $42 billion. Yeah. So it's more than double, more than double. And you have to look at the capacity of the industry in terms of labour and in terms of materials yeah. to be able to satisfy that demand. So that that worries me and it worries uh, quite a lot of other people who have infrastructure projects as, as well. So, so we're talking about the cost of the actual delivery. It, 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 it's, it, it's just more than the cost. It's the availability. Mm-hmm. It is is just the outright availability of the right the right skill sets in labour. Uh, and the right materials. Some of some of the quarries already are having trouble keeping up with demand for for, for some of their outputs, and that's only going to, be, going to be exacerbated over the coming years. Can I ask what your role is? What? How would you describe your role? Is it bringing it all together? Like who's the who's the one providing the vision around technology, for example? Who's the one providing the vision around the infrastructure? How does how does it all come together? And when, are you the are you the conductor? I guess I'm. I guess I am the conductor. Uh, I hope I'm getting better on a on a daily basis uh, at, at that. But we're taking inputs from lots of lots of different experts in the field, so to speak. So we're we're talking to other airports around the world uh, and and what they've done right and what they would do differently. Yep. Um, we're speaking to companies that specialise in servicing uh, the aviation sector. Yes. And uh, with their R and D scientists as to as to what they're doing uh, and the likelihood of that sort of new technology. Technology um, being accredited and being accepted in the industry in 2026 when uh, when we first open, uh, so it, it's true to say that we're taking um, information from a wide variety of sources. In 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 the next few weeks, we've got a uh, professor of artificial intelligence coming to to speak to senior management and the board uh, on uh, where where artificial intelligence currently is, but where it's likely to be uh, in eight years' time when yep. when we open and how we can best employ it. Uh, in in the airport, uh, so it, it's all it's all of these people who are highly specialised in their own individual fields. And then, as you rightly point out, um, the, the the real skill in a lot of this is going to be bringing it together. Because mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is, we will have a combination of very conventional technologies in the new airport. Now, baggage handling, for example, falls into two buckets. It falls into materials handling. Um, relatively conventional mechanical handling systems like conveyors. Yep. But it also has another component, which is the controls component, digital digital controls, which which can be uh, looked after by artificial intelligence. Mm. So we've we've got an airport that's going to have some very familiar, very conventional, uh, very proven types of technology, which is really important in the industry. You, you want something that is virtually fail-safe. Mm. But it's also going to have technologies which are, and I continually say, at the leading edge but not at the bleeding edge. So technologies that work. Yeah, okay. uh, if the technologies don't work, then passengers won't want to use the airport. Airlines certainly won't want to use the airport. Freight operators won't want to use the airport. And we, can, we can't have that because the federal government has been very clear, uh, and that is that they want us to create a successful airport business, yep. not, not just a successful airport. And so uh, we're pulling out all stops to make sure that what we deliver to the local community and to and to the, the state and to the nation is something that they can be proud of for, for decades to come. Because, as I mentioned earlier, this, this piece of infrastructure will be around for at least 100 years. It has a 99-year lease on the ground. Mm-hmm. It's federal land. Um, but it's likely to be much longer than that if aviation doesn't change substantially. Um, and aviation will change to some extent. But it will still it will still need an airport. So we're likely to see, I think, the uh, the advent again of supersonic transport. Um, probably not like the Concorde, um, but uh, nonetheless, supersonic transport. Uh, we may even see. Certainly, won't be in my lifetime, but we we may even see the advent of what's called hypersonic transport. What does that mean? Well, a conventional jet today will get you from. Uh, Sydney to Los Angeles in about 13 hours, roughly, depending on the winds, but about 13 hours. A supersonic uh, transport will get you there in about seven hours. A hypersonic transport will get you there probably in two hours. Now, imagine the difference 
that communities will experience in decades hence. If you could travel from Sydney to Los Angeles in two hours, Sydney to New York, to New York in three hours, Sydney to London in three hours, imagine what, what that, what that does. I mean, it, it opens up a whole, whole new world and it, certainly for passengers, pr- probably not for freight, I would suspect, but certainly for passengers. It, it changes the dynamic of, uh, of the world uh, in the way it interacts and the way that nations interact with each other, populations interact with each other. Now, of course, it won't be affordable by all, but the reality is that the, the world is, um, becoming richer. Large parts of the world are becoming richer. Uh, not all parts of the world, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, there will, I think, be a market for this sort of travel. There will be the well-heeled who will be prepared to pay for it yep. and who will pay for it. Businesses will probably be prepared to pay for it and they'll, they'll pay for it. So it's it's a game changer. It really is a game changer. So you'll still have the conventional sorts of travel that you have today. <laughs> you'll probably then have supersonic transport and at some stage in the future, technology allowing and Economics allowing, I think you'll probably see hypersonic aircraft. But unfortunately for me, that won't be in my lifetime. I think with hypersonic aircraft, you're probably talking 50 or 60 or 70 years hence. Supersonic aircraft, possibly in the next 20 years, possibly. Graham, you sit in an ideal position. When we have um, these discussions, quite often we talk to the chief execs and ask them around their their thoughts on innovation. Mm risk-taking, et cetera. Mm. Mm. Now, here you are building one of the biggest infrastructure projects, as you say, which you're going to be looking forward to and being there in 100 years' time. Mm. With this opportunity, are Australian companies putting their hands up or are we actually going offshore and copying uh, everybody else and then applying it? I'll be interested in your perspective of we talk as a nation, we're great innovators, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of the best key projects going out there. Mm. You're across it all. Mm. What's your perspective? Well, to, to, to be realistic, I think it's a combination of both. I think there are some things that, that you can take from overseas at relatively low cost that are proven um, that probably aren't going to change substantially over a, a long period of time. And so why reinvent the wheel? But there are other things, I think, where we can be thought leaders, where we can – and we're working very closely with Department of Home Affairs in Canberra, mm-hmm. looking at how we can speed up the flow of passengers through airports without compromising security. In fact, speeding up the flow of passengers and at the same time improving security. So the, this this is something that um, governments are very, very keen to do, and I think that we can be at the forefront of, of, of this, to be honest with you. Uh, and that's that's what we're going to try to do. We can for, – for, for, for some of these new new processes and some of these new technologies, certainly not all, but we can we can prove them and we can we can open with them and we can be a world leader in them. How do you acquire the information to lead? Hmm. Well, ag- again, uh, if you're talking about te- technology leads, it's uh, no one can no one can see, and I don't pretend to any more than anybody else. Um, you certainly can't foresee what's going to happen. I think much much more than, than five or six years out at the moment. To be okay. quite to be quite frank with you, yep. and we're opening eight years hence. Yep. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we have to place most of our orders in that five year sort of time frame. So yes. we we can generally look out about about that far with a not total certainty, obviously, but with some some degree of confidence. Um, and where we're taking our lead from is people, as I said earlier, who are, who are working in, in these fields at, at the forefront of, of this, of this sort of technology, these, these sorts of processes that are, that are likely, likely to change and that we can have an input to, um, that, that we can in some cases test. So the airport will go through a period that's called ORAT, O-R-A-T, which is Operational Readiness and Airport Testing. And um, some of these technologies that will give us the opportunity to be able to trial them in the early stages. Now, we won't be trialling a lot of things. Um, we're not an R&D company. We're not meant to be. No. Um, but for some of the applications, um, that it may may well work very well for us. So the airport will have uh, undoubtedly a high degree of automation. Uh, it will have artificial intelligence. It will have uh, augmented reality. It will have virtual reality. Biometrics, of course, will be part of the course by the time we open. I think pretty much every airport will have biometrics. What do you mean by that? Well, biometrics will be facial recognition or iris recognition or whatever the case may be. So yep. um, depending on how privacy laws spin out and what have you, uh, I would I would expect there to be biometrics in wide use, not just in airports. Yep. Um, but I know that um, rail systems right around the world are looking at, at using biometrics. So let me give you an example of how that might work. Um, let's say that you're coming out to Western Sydney Airport and you're booked on a, uh, a flight to Los Angeles or to Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get on the train because you're coming by train. Mm-hmm. You get on the train at uh, Central. Yes. And uh, 
the biometric reader at Central talks to our artificial intelligence and says, Greg's on the train and he's on the right train and knows which train you're on and you're coming out to Western Sydney Airport. Yep. And our AI system knows that you're booked on a flight to Los Angeles or to London, wherever it might be, Hong Kong, that day uh, and that you're on your way. And that given the time lapse and given that we know that there are no obstacles to the trains being on time that day, that you will arrive at the airport on time. We can say to the airline, Greg's going to be there on time. There's a high degree of confidence that you're going to be there on time. What we can offer to the airlines is we can tell them in advance, in an ideal world, we can tell them in advance that everybody who's booked on your plane is on their way. Or we can say 95% of the people who are booked on your plane yep. are on their way, which means 5% of your seats are vacant. What would you like to do with them? Would you like to resell them on the spot at a yep. discount? Yep. Would you Would you like to leave them vacant? What would you like to – the fact that they're, they're now not carrying that extra weight means you don't have to load as many meals. The fact you're not carrying that extra weight means you don't have to carry as much fuel, et cetera. Et cetera. That's putting it simplistically. But you can see the sorts of principles we're talking about here. So biometrics would pick you up certainly when you are, uh, walk through the doors of the airport, but they could pick you up well before that either on a train or they could pick up through number plate reading, for example. We could pick you up as you uh, get onto the M5 yes. on, on the way out. Uh, and we'd know you're on your way because we'd know to associate you with the number plate of the car. and yeah. Again, and it's an ideal world, but it's a very different sort of environment to that which we're talking about today. It's to give a great deal of certainty uh, to the operation of a network business, and, and aviation is a network business. Yeah. So this means that the airline will know that it can get away on time. Uh, it will know it doesn't have to wait for somebody. It will know that it's going to have so many seats empty or whatever the case may be. Uh, so this is the sort of technology that is put to um, very practical and very very positive use. Would there be ever a station in the uh, in the actual city itself, Graham, similar say to say um, say Hong Kong? Where I can leave my bag in Central, yep. and then you know three or four hours later catch that catch the uh, the fast train to the airport, you know after having having quite beer with a couple of friends and I'm on my way. Well, I think I think that'll happen. I think it'll happen. It's a it's a question of timing. It's a question of money. It's an expensive exercise to do. Mm. Um, but do I think it will happen? Yes, I do. I do. Um, will it happen with us in stage one? Hard to say. Probably by stage two, I would think it would be it would be possible. Stage one. I'm not as confident, but sure. but we're looking at it, I have to say. We are looking at it. What type of characteristics do you look in the executives and the, in the, uh, in the team that you're bringing on? Mm. So um, we look for, first of all, the right sort of experience, the right sort of track record, uh, the right sort of qualifications. Um, but I think importantly we look for um, intelligence. We look for common sense. We look for judgment. We look for humility. Um, I think humility is really important in, in any role in a company, particularly in leadership roles. Yeah. Um, we look for uh, a set of values that align with our own. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in, integrity, um, inclusion, the, the willingness to include all people, uh, collaboration, pioneering. Uh, courage is very important to us. Yeah. And I think the uh, the first amongst all of our values, first amongst equals, I call it, is is uh, is safety. Um, safety is incredibly important to us. And um, we've implemented best practice in the organisation uh, for, for, for safety. And I mean best, best practice. We are, let me uh, say, red hot. On this particular issue, uh, we've uh, we've got committees uh, in place to look at it. We we self monitor ourselves in terms of in terms of it. Um, we're looking at some measures that some come from from a safe, personal safety perspective and uh, a wider safety perspective that some companies um, would find onerous, shall I say? But we believe best practice dictates that we we put them in place. How are you going to motivate the team to come in on time and mm. on budget? That's the biggest fear all Australians have out yeah, there yeah. with any major infrastructure project. It's the biggest fear I have about any <laughs> infrastructure project. <laughs> um, well, the, the challenge for us is going to be, particularly in terms of uh, the construction industry and its ability to um, to, to do what we need it to do. Um, but having having said that, how do, how do you motivate people? I, I think this this project is a little bit different to some of the other projects. It, it really is, I, I, and I think I speak on behalf of most of the team, We've now got about 135 people uh, right. out, out at Liverpool, which is which is our, our um, head office, let me call it our head office. Yep. Um, I think the the fact of the matter is that the vision for this airport is pretty clear. 
um, we we know we know what we have to do. It's uh, it's we're not a BAU uh, at, at this stage. Uh, we're we're certainly have going through startup mode. We're probably towards the end of startup mode. Mm-hmm. Um, but this project is filled with uncertainty, but it's filled with a huge amount of promise and opportunity. And I think most of the people, if not all of the people in the organisation, see their input as reshaping that part of the world, reshaping Western Sydney. This project is transformative. Yep. Um, we know that we're going to build something that's very different to that which exists currently. We know we're going to build something which has a real sense of place for Western Sydney, that the residents, the locals can be proud of and something that's going to last 100 years, 200 years, whatever the case may be. And for for most, again, if not all of the people on the team, I think they see it as a legacy issue. Yeah. That um, and I'm, Interesting, as I said, I was out at an airport yesterday and uh, this, this, our site manager there was, uh, was, was talking and he said, you know, this will be my last job. He said, I'll, I'll re- retire after this. But he said, I'm going to bring my grandkids out here and I'm going to tell them Poppy did some of this. Unquote. Pop, yeah. Poppy did some of this. Pretty inspiring and stuff. And it's that's inspiring stuff. Yeah. You know? And uh, and I think for a lot of people there, that's the case. I, I was saying to people just before I came came into the studio today, I was I was saying well, what we're going to do is hold an open day, another open day. We've held one already, mm-hmm. an open day, so you can bring your children, your partners, your parents along um, to see what you're doing here. That's going to reshape this region to for them to understand how important your job is. And it's not just going into work every day, filling out some forms and then coming home. This is a fundamental nation building that you're participating in here. Couldn't agree more. Big role. Where do you spend your time? And what I mean by that, you've got different chief execs act and think in different ways, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But are you one that do you allow yourself enough time to think, you know, three, five, ten years out? How do you pace yourself? Maybe sort of give us some insight in, a, in a, like you say, a groundbreaking and uh, game-changing infrastructure project. Yeah. Um, so we, we've tried to establish what we call a cadence in the organisation, a rhythm, if you like. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, 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 prob- the problem is the rhythm keeps changing on a daily basis because the project keeps changing on a regular basis. But um, we have to set ourselves aside some time that we can um, – Talk as, as as groups of individuals about what might be. So we've got a blue, we've got blue sky workshops yes. that we participate in. Um, there's there's that. So um, talk us through that. What is a blue sky workshop uh, oh, over, over over in Liverpool? Yeah, blue sky workshop. Um, get into a room, um, sit down, the right mix of people. You know that they, they get on, and we 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 ask a lot of what if questions. So you know, what if you didn't? What if there was no border control? What if there was no immigration? Um, what if there were no arrival cards? What, what if? What if you could turn a plane around in 30 minutes instead of 60 minutes? What if? What if uh, cargo could go, air cargo could go through much, much faster than it does today? All of these what ifs. In an ideal world, what would you want? So, you know, mapping an ideal passenger journey, mapping an ideal airline journey, mapping, an, and by that I mean the journey the aircraft go through, mm-hmm. mapping an ideal uh, freight forwarder journey. What are, what are, what's the idea? No, no constraints. What would you, and then why couldn't we do that? Because we've got green fields. Why couldn't why couldn't we do that? So some you know, very abstract ideas come up, and then some of them get shot down, and um, some of them are worth pursuing. So that's what a blue sky workshop looks like, with lots of lots of caffeine to keep people <laughs> alert. Fair enough. Stakeholder management, mm. it's a big one. Stakeholder management is huge. Uh, and when you think about the stakeholders for the airport, um, we've identified something like 100 groups, groups yeah. of stakeholders. And, they, and they're, undoubtedly are more than that. Yep. But we've identified about 100. So I spend about half my time on stakeholder management. Most stakeholders, I mean... There are the politicians on both sides of parliament yep. uh, and at the different levels of government. Um, there are staff. Um, there are residents. There are customers of the airport, um, freight forwarders, airlines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are those who are opposed to the airport, and there there is a minority that are opposed to the airport. Um, all of those stakeholders uh, I devote about half of my time to because I'm a great believer in you've got to be present with them and you've got to be available to explain what you're doing and why you're doing. Um, now, the vast majority of people like what we're doing, um, and we're very fortunate in that regard. The people who don't like what we're doing, will we change their minds? Probably not. Can we give them some degree of reassurance? 
Hopefully we can. I think any major project like this does fill some people with appreh- apprehension. Mm-hmm. I, I understand that. It, it does. It, it creates an apprehensive environment. And I think explaining what you're doing and why you're doing and how you're looking to mitigate any adverse impacts on them is is really important. Um, somebody said to me the other day, uh, so you can guarantee there will not be any more noise as a result of the airport. Well, of course I can't. Right. But what I can guarantee is that we will take absolutely every step we can to minimise the, the noise that there is. And and both both sides of Parliament have ex- have exactly the same same view on this. Uh, all levels of government have the same view on this. We want to be a good corporate citizen, yep. um, and 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 so we will do all that we possibly can. Uh, to reduce the noise impact on, uh, on on residents. At the same time, you've got to look at the upside, and the upside here is enormous in terms of jobs. A huge number of jobs will be created in the region. Have you got any sort of estimates on that? We do. Um, during construction, um, the estimates, uh, and I think they're pretty accurate, uh, something like 11,000 new jobs will be created. On opening, something like uh, 28,000 new jobs will be created. But then, that because that doesn't include the Aerotropolis, if you start thinking yeah. about the Aerotropolis... Around about 200,000 new jobs will be created just in the Aerotropolis. Not the region now, just in the Aerotropolis. Currently, our catchment area has about about 2 million people. Yep. That will grow over the next 20 years to 3 million people. Okay. What most people don't understand is that already Western Sydney is the third largest economic region in Australia after Sydney and Melbourne. Yeah. It's Western Sydney yep. as it is now. Yep. A lot of people every day of the, the working week travel from the west – to the east, and then back to the west again. They spend about two hours of their time travelling, un- un- largely unproductive time. Yes. If you can harness that and mm-hmm. you can reduce it to what's known as the 30-minute city, mm-hmm. where people live and work within 30 minutes, uh, then the increase in productivity, however you want to define productivity, is enormous. Whether productivity is spending more time with your family, whether it's working out, um, whether it's doing a second job, whatever the case may be, um, the benefits are enormous. And to people's health and their, their well-being, enormous as well. And on top of that, you, you cut down the pollution that's involved in people travelling from the west to the east and the east to the west five days a week. You cut that down as well. So the economic benefits, the social benefits, are absolutely enormous. So it's a catalyst for dramatic change, isn't it? It's, it is the spark, yes. It's the spark that ignites the development of this part of the, part of the world. It's the catalyst. So what's keeping you awake at night then? Uh, what's keeping me awake at night? I think uh, the state of the industry, uh, of the construction industry, yeah, keeps, that, keeps me awake at night. It's really worrying you, isn't it? That, that, that worries me. It, it, does, it does worry me. For this project and, and all of the associated projects with it, so the roads, the rail, that worries me. And I know it worries a lot of other people as well. Um, that's largely what keeps me awake at night. Making making sure that the staff on the job have as many obstacles removed as possible. Part of my role is to clear out obstacles yep. from them so that they can just get on and do what they have to do. So um, I, I say to my staff, whenever I have the one-on-one meetings, my, my final uh, little splurge with them is to say, how can I make your life easier? What can I do to make your life easier? Because I think that's my role. And then it's their role for their staff to make their staff's lives easier as well. What's your definition of success, Graham? So I think success for this project is having an airport that uh, the nation can be proud of, certainly that uh, the local community can be proud of. I think it's an airport, obviously, that comes in on time on budget. There's no doubt about that, and that's the key criteria for me, for me to be assessed against. Um, they're, they're probably the, the key aspects of success. I'd like to be able to look back on opening day when the fire trucks are splashing water over the first <laughs> aircraft tour to arrive. I'd, I'd like to, to look back and I'd like all of the people who've worked on it to look back and be able to say hand on heart, we did this. This is, this is our baby. And in years to come, um, no one, no one will remember who we are. Um, but that's fine. We'll know who we are. Our families will know who we are. Uh, and uh, we can we can walk away proud with what's behind us. So you certainly express this with a lot of passion and enthusiasm. Is this yeah. the uh, the best thing that happened to you to you in your career? Undoubtedly, without hesitation, undoubtedly. Better than getting those wings. Yes, better than get better than getting the wings, but only by a small margin. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, what if you were speaking to the young Graham? Hmm. What advice would you give him now? Uh, I'd say don't be quite as impatient in in your early career. Um, do what you love. Don't chase the money. 
um, find yourself uh, a good male mentor and a good female mentor, model yourselves on them. Did you plan your career a lot or was it just by hard work and opportunity? Uh, I'm, I'm the accidental tourist, um, to be honest with you. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm the accidental tourist. Uh, no, my, uh, my, my career has, has largely been uh, stops and starts. Uh, to be to be honest with you, it, it, uh, the plans that I had never eventuated. What uh, were the plans? And, oh well, the plans was was, was to uh, be a pediatric surgeon. <laughs> to be quite frank with you, uh, that was my plan, uh, and that didn't that didn't eventuate for a range of reasons. Uh, and uh, then I, uh, I uh, once I'd learned to fly, of course, aviation was in the blood. Once once you start sniffing jet fuel and, uh, and what have you, um, it's very it's very hard to to not be addicted to it. And so when the opportunity for Qantas came up, and the opportunity with Qantas came up twice, not just once, the first time I rejected it. Oh, really? Um, yes, the first time I rejected it. Uh, and the second time I accepted it. And uh, from from there, um, aviation was was really my one, my one true love. And um, I'm back in it again, and um, I'm, I, I can't believe my luck. Graham, for all those businesses out there, or mums and dads and um, listeners to this uh this podcast mm. is there a uh, opening day or anything or, an, or another event coming up that we should be potentially putting in our diaries um we're not planning one just yet it's very it's it's very early days so okay. so we have been thinking about let me flick flick to the very end if well, you okay. yeah i was going to say well how do we keep in, how do we keep in tap <laughs> and how do we keep in oh, our, our understanding of what's happening so it's, it's pretty straightforward so we have a um a regular column in the local papers um, we also um, do the regular news releases. Social media, we're active on, on social media. Um, we've had a, a smoking ceremony with the local Indigenous folks, the Garrett people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, we, we had that. Um, we are, if I, if I flick forward to our planned opening day, which is the 24th of December 2026, so yeah. it's Christmas Eve of 2026. Wow. Um, if I flick forward to then, one of the things we've been talking about doing is having a charity walk down the runway uh, for, for local charities and inviting the community to come in and, and pay $5 for a family or some, some nominal amount. Great idea. And to, to, to walk down the runway before, before it officially opens. Uh, and, and how long is that runway again? It's 3,700 <laughs> metres. <laughs> or it will be three thousand seven hundred meters, but you can you can determine how far you, how far you walk. <laughs> you can determine how far you walk. Uh, hopefully, I'd be able to make the entire three thousand seven hundred meters. Um, but yes, yeah, so we've been planning to get. We're also opening a visitor center uh, in the middle of next year, and this will have both a um, a, a lot of audiovisual digital content inside to show you how the airport's going to evolve over time, what it looks like at the end of the day. But the the the, the front of it, it's a, it's a round building. The front of the building is all glass and faces directly across where the terminal is being constructed, mm-hmm. and also faces north and south, which is the orientation of the runway. And so people, community groups. Interest, interest groups, um, whoever, will be uh, uh, available to will be able rather to come in and to uh, book time to uh, to witness the airport under construction and to see what it's going to be to be like. So that visitor centre uh, has we've awarded the tender for that. Yep, uh, the design has um, largely been done, and uh, we'll do the official opening um, in the middle of next year. Graham, there's one big dread that I have. Mm. My old man was a, a civil engineer. Mm. And he always complained about uh, thinking 50, 100 years ahead. Mm. Typically, Australians, we build two two lanes as opposed to four. Mm. You're building, would you say, two runways? Mm. Is that enough, bearing in mind you're talking 50 to 100 years? Look, I think um, certainly 50 years out, yes. I think probably 100 years out, yes. Oh, okay. I think beyond 100 years, you'll be looking for a third major uh, major airport somewhere, somewhere in, in, in the Sydney basin. But certainly at 50 years, there's, there's no question it will, it will be sufficient on, on all the current projections. And probably out, uh, if not 100 years, very close to 100 years would be, would be my anticipation. And if technology does improve as it, as it will, yeah. um, then the chances are that between, uh, Sydney Kingsford Smith and Western Sydney Airport, probably out to 100 years, I think you will have enough capacity. But, There'll be a lot of thinking by the people who are present at that time as to where do we build the next airport. Don't forget, Western Sydney Airport has been in the pipeline for about 50 years, yes, about right. half a century. Uh, and now's the, absolutely the right time to build it because of the state of aviation capacity in the Sydney Basin. Uh, so 
I'm I'm pretty confident. Um, certainly for certainly fifty years, I don't think is an issue. Um, and, and close to a hundred years, if not a hundred years, I'd, I'd have a pretty high degree of confidence we'd be all right. Graham, is there any uh, last thing you uh, thoughts you'd like to um, pass on to the audience? No, look, I I, I think that um, this, as I said, is is a game changer for mm. uh, for aviation uh, in, in in Australia. It's uh, it's a true nation building project. There's no question about that. We have to be sensitive to the local community. Uh, and and we we are being rest rest assured. Yeah. We want to build an airport that's highly sustainable, that's environmentally friendly, uh, and that is um, that 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 serves as a, a bellwether for what Australia can do when it comes to infrastructure projects. Graham, thanks for joining us today. I've thoroughly enjoyed this discussion. You have been listening to No Limitations. Thank you. <laughs>